Thank you for coming to tonight's lecture, our second evening of this Race, Ethnicity, and Identity Conference at Grand Rapids Community College. Tonight, we have our second keynote speaker, Dr. Courtney Gallagher, Assistant Professor of Geography and Women's Studies at Northern Illinois University. Dr. Gallagher was awarded the PhD at Michigan State University. So for those of you that are MSU fans, pay particular attention, please. Okay. She has done quite a bit of field work in Africa especially, and we'll be talking tonight on these matters in reference to linking environmental justice and community empowerment through urban agriculture in East Africa. Thank you once again for coming this evening, and I'll now turn it over to Dr. Gallagher. Am I on? Well, I'm really pleased to be here, and thank you for that introduction. Um, because I get to talk about something that I really love talking about, which is this idea of community empowerment through urban agriculture. Um, and I'm also completely amazed to see so many young and smiling student faces here at 7 p.m. in the evening. So thank you for taking time out of your day to um, be part of this conference and to attend my talk. Um, as uh, Dr. Devo said, I am on faculty at Northern Illinois University, which is just west of Chicago, and I'm in my third year there. So I'm a recent alum of Michigan State University and had a really fabulous um, experience there and very much miss Michigan. And so it's nice to be back in my uh, recently home territory. How many of you are familiar with the, environmental, the term environmental justice? Is this something that people have maybe heard about in classes or is this brand new? Relatively new. So environmental justice is this movement that um, became more known in the United States and has now spread around the world. And it's this movement that was started by individuals, primarily people of color, to link um, issues of environmental harm or environmental problems to uh, to issues of identity and race and class. So what people noticed was that when they were looking at different environmental issues, oftentimes the people who were being placed in harm's way in terms of those environmental issues were people who were um, minority populations, who were lower class populations in the United States. And this really started in Warren County, North Carolina in um, the, what year was that? Well. 1970s, um, when there was a company there that decided it wanted to dispose of a bunch of PCB waste that they had from their company, and they dumped it all over the roadsides throughout North Carolina. And the state decided they needed to clean this up because PCBs are um, carcinogenic and quite toxic, and so they were going to go basically clean up all the soil, or strip all the soil, and then move it to a landfill. And the place that they decided to target for a landfill was a predominantly African-American um, community and a community that was, if you ranked all of the counties in the state of North Carolina, then like at the very bottom, it was the poorest county. And so people woke up and said, you know, there is a reason we are being targeted as a community. And so um, this was, in a way, the birth of the environmental justice movement. There were mass protests, people laying down in the street. These are the trucks carrying soil. Um, that uh, we're trying to dump this PCB-laden soil. But this, this movement has really continued. And so as we went through this environmental awakening in the United States, so if you think about things like Silent Spring by Rachel Carson, who was um, waking people up to the issues, um, dangers associated with pesticides in our environment. We had these protests in Warren County. Love Canal was another big incident out in the um, New York area near Niagara Falls where they figured out that the company, again, had dumped a lot of toxic pollutants. They had capped the landfill, built a school on top of it, and everybody was getting really ill. And so over a period of a decade, they decided they needed to evacuate the population. And then on a more global issue, we have um, things like the uh, Bhopal, India, where there was this massive explosion at a pesticide plant. And so these are isolated incidents in a sense, but they're not. They're, you see this pattern, a global pattern, of um, 
environmental problems being associated or uh, at-risk populations being more associated with exposure to these environmental problems. And this includes in East Africa. So the Green Belt Movement is a movement that was started by a woman who went on to win a Nobel Peace Prize named Wangari Mathai. And she was actually the first woman in East Africa to get a PhD. And she was, she was part of the Kennedy Airlift Program that brought Barack Obama's fa uh, father to the United States to go to college. She was part of that same program. So she came here, got educated, went back to Kenya, got her PhD there. Practiced veterinary medicine for a while and started to realize there were all these problems in the environment. And one of the most pressing ones was that Kenya was logging down all their forests at a rapid, rapid rate. And because women's livelihoods in Kenya were so dependent upon the forests, the loss of trees meant not just soil erosion and you know, loss of forest cover and all sorts of things, but it meant that women disproportionately were being impacted. So she started this women's movement in Kenya called the Green Belt Movement, where she would go into local communities, she would pay women to plant these tree nurseries and then transplant it. And the idea was to build these big lines of green trees, so green belts throughout the country. And they've planted millions, if not billions, of trees throughout, Southern, uh, throughout Africa now because it's spread from Kenya to other areas. But what was interesting is what started as an environmental movement really turned into this um, much broader sort of social justice movement where they realized that protecting the environment meant changing sort of the political culture in Kenya. And so it became this movement for democracy, this movement to fight for women to be able to voice their control over the environment. And so as I said, she went on to win a Nobel Peace Prize in 2004 for her work. She was one of the first environmental activists and one of the first women to be recognized for this. And there are all sorts of cool children's books that have been written about her. She's one of the few female scientists where I feel like you can reliably find cool children's books about her. So for any of you who have nieces or nephews or children at home, um, somewhere to look. But in the United States, what we've seen in the last few decades and what we're very slowly starting to see when we talk about um, environmental justice issues in other parts of the world is that environmental justice is be now being, it's moving beyond concerns about exposure to toxins in the environment. And it's moving beyond concerns about sort of conserving our natural resources and, and maybe regrowing trees or forest cover. And we're starting to talk about food. Because food is one of the ways that you can most intimately interact with nature, right? Everybody has to eat food. Everybody, in some way, is tied to the supply chain of growing food. And the quality of food that we produce is really, really tied to our environment. And a lot of people have started to feel very disconnected from the food that they eat. How many of you grow any of the food that you eat? How many of you grow more than, say, 10% of the food that you eat? one or two lonely hands back there, but most of us do not, right? Most of us are somewhat or very disconnected from our food system. And so there's been this movement in the United States to really think about how do we link these concepts of social justice and environmental justice to this idea of food justice, so reconnecting people to their food system. And it's not just that people are disconnected, it's that specific populations have been very disconnected from the food system. So if you look at Detroit, for an example, it, within the city limits of Detroit, there are no big box grocery stores. And so food access becomes a, um, almost a racial issue if you look in a lot of cities where low income populations or minority populations are disproportionately disconnected from their food systems. And so there are lots of organizations. In this particular one, I took these photos from an organization called Growing Power that are thinking about how do we reconnect people to their food systems in a way that is also empowering local communities and addressing some of these inequities um, that are related to race and class and identity. So Growing Power is this very cool organization that was started by Will Allen. Um, and it started in Milwaukee. They have a branch in Chicago. Has anyone here heard of Growing Power? Look them up. They're awesome. So Will Allen was a farmer down in the south, um, had ties to Milwaukee area, decided he wanted to come back to Milwaukee. and. Um, and create this sort of youth empowerment program where he would get uh, high-risk youth to work on his farm. And they've now expanded their farm to provide CFA shares and all sorts of training about urban agriculture to um, inner city Milwaukee. And they also operate a farm in Chicago along the same model. So community gardens are obviously really popular. 
Um, I imagine the Grand Rapids area has community gardens because nearly all cities in the United States have community gardens at this point in time. And in a way, on, on, a, on a fundamental level, it's just a way for people to grow food. Like oftentimes, you know, hey, now I have a convenient plot of land where I didn't have one maybe in my backyard. But on a broader level, a lot of the ideas behind community gardens are how do we link people back to this idea of nature, back to this idea of food, and, um, and the purpose is broader than just growing a few tomatoes to eat, right? The idea is how do you bring the community together in a way that can empower them? So what kinds of social connections can be made through community gardening? And so this has been very effective in some places, less effective in others. A lot of the times it has to do with how dynamic the leaders are. Um, but community gardening um, and urban gardening in the, uh, I would say, in developed countries, so in North America, in Europe, has, in Australia, has really received a lot of attention and be, has been seen as a really sort of powerful way to get into communities and kind of get people reconnected to their food system. And another reason that urban agriculture has been receiving a lot of attention in developed countries is that um, it improves access to green spaces. So in a city, like just looking outside and driving around Grand Rapids, a lot of you have access to trees here, right? Like you see trees on a regular basis. There's decent amount of open green space. But there are definitely areas in our country and areas in other parts of the world where things have been built in a way that people literally do not have access to open green spaces. And so building these community gardens allows people to start to reconnect with their food system and um, reconnect with nature in a way that's different because they don't have access to trees. One of the things that we know in the United States is that access to green space um, often varies based on income, again, so based on class, and also based on race. So there was this cool study down out of the University of Wisconsin, uh, Milwaukee, that looked at uh, access to green space in the city of Milwaukee, and they found that the black populations were um, especially unlikely to have access to green space in terms of forest cover in their neighborhoods as compared to the white populations and the Hispanic populations. And so there was this racial inequity in something that one might not think about, so having trees in their neighborhoods. So urban gardens, urban agriculture is seen as a way to do this. So this is the model that we have been talking about urban agriculture in the United States for the last several decades. Um, we talk about urban agriculture as a way of growing food. We talk about this idea of needing to empower communities and this idea of food justice. But what's uh, interesting is that this view of urban agriculture hasn't really been exported to developing countries. When you look at urban agriculture in a lot of developing countries, all of a sudden, what we're talking about is, oh, this is a coping strategy for poor people. So poor people move to the city from rural areas, they grow a bit of food until they get on their feet, and then they're done with it. So while people are almost evangelizing urban agriculture in the United States, in areas that I've worked in East Africa, urban agriculture is still very much not taboo, but just it's not given a lot of thought. Even though in Kenya, where I'm going to talk about, in Malawi, where I've done a lot of work, 60 to 70 percent of the population has backyard gardens or some sort of urban farm. So this isn't like something that just happens, but it's something that's being ignored. Sometimes when people are talking about urban agriculture in Africa, there's a little bit of conversation about environmental quality. Like, should people be using wastewater? Is the soil good enough? But basically, it's, con it's considered to be not worthy of attention because it's just something poor people do. And oftentimes, and is the case in Kenya, it's actually illegal. Um, so uh, definitely not the case here in the United States. But this is a relic of colonialism. Um, during col the colonial era in Kenya, African migrant laborers were brought to the cities to work for the white colonial population. And they actually outlawed the practice of farming in the city as a way of suppressing the black African population. So if they weren't allowed to grow food, they would be dependent upon the jobs of the, you know, with the white colonial um, settlers who were in power. And so it was considered to be sort of a backwards practice that one shouldn't allow. Um, and there's a lot of sort of relic. There's a relic of that in the sense that even the upper class black population in Nairobi now still considers um, urban agriculture to be like a peasant's thing or something that poor people do. And um, the police very much still have the right to go in and either 
burn down the crops, arrest the people doing it, or oftentimes collect a bribe in return for allowing the people to continue to farm. And then another thing that you see about um, surrounding discussions about urban agriculture, not just in Africa, but in many parts of the world, is this idea that it's just not worth investing in because it's not something that people in space-constrained environments can do. And by space-constrained, I'm talking basically about illegal settlements or slums, um, which is, makes up a really large population of the urban, um, the urban area. So in Nairobi, about 60% of people are considered to be part of the urban poor and live in one of the 19 or 20 slums that are in Nairobi, which is the capital of Kenya. So we're talking about a really significant um, proportion of the urban population living in these environments where you know, the Ministry of Agriculture, extension workers, NGOs, everybody kind of says, eh, it's probably not worth thinking about urban, growing food in that environment. So there's a lot that's being overlooked if you compare how we're talking about food and agriculture and community empowerment here in the United States compared to how we're talking about agriculture in Kenya. And in particular, this idea that um, urban agriculture could play any role in community empowerment and environmental justice is largely being overlooked. So I'm going to talk to you about um, work that came out of my dissertation at Michigan State University on urban agriculture in Kenya. Um, and I'm going to focus on the Kibera slums, which there are debates over the slides because it's really hard to get a census um, in a slum environment. But it's one of the larger slums in, in Africa. So Kenya, East Africa. Kibera is an interesting place. It's um, in the center of Nairobi, so it's surrounded by all of these big like uh, open estates and golf courses and shopping malls, and then there's this incredibly densely planned settlement. So it's only about maybe a mile, uh, one and a half to two square miles, probably on the order of 400 to 500,000 people living in there, on the order of maybe five to 600 latrines, so not a lot of toilet, no um, legally accessible water, no government-sponsored sanitation systems. Basically, it's a free-for-all in Kibera. So Kibera uh, was settled following World War II, uh, but there, nobody really has title deeds to the land. So officially, in the eyes of the Kenyan government, Kibera doesn't exist. And so there just aren't a lot of services in Kibera. Kibera is divided into all of these different neighborhoods, um, which are they call villages. and. Uh, they're somewhat divided, like they're somewhat self-organized along ethnic lines. Um, and this is largely the result of some post-election violence that occurred in 2008, um, where there was tribal warfare that was very politically motivated. And so people ended up kind of re regrouping themselves. So as a view looking into the Kibera slums, so these are the homes in Kibera. They're super, super close together. So a pathway between um, the houses might be as wide as these two rows of chairs. Um, and each of those housing blocks that you see there probably has three or four housing units in it, each of which contains a family. Um, so very close, very densely packed environment. Um, this is one of the more open roads that kind of runs through the center of Kibera. And what we're starting to see is that people are trying to farm. So even though there's uh, officially no farming activities going on in Kibera, people have, in fact, started trying to farm. But because there isn't a lot of open space and because they can't legally access any of that space, what people are doing instead is they're, doing, they're practicing something called sack gardening. So they go get these big nylon burlap sacks that are used um, to transport things like rice or onions or things that get sold at the little shops on the corner. They fill them up with soil with a column of stones in the middle to help with infiltration. And then not only now do you have space to plant into the top of the sack, but you can plant into the side of the sack. So an area where maybe previously you used to be able to grow three or four plants, now you can plant 40. So this is a better picture. Um, this is kale growing in one of the sacks. Kenyans love kale. They call it sukuma wiki, which means stretching out the week um, because it's a poor man's food. And they eat it on a very regular basis. And luckily, kale um, can, 
you're able to harvest kale and allow it to continually to grow. So as long as you harvest from the bottom, it'll just keep going up and up and up. It starts to look like a Dr. Seuss plant. You know, it sort of like wind itself up to the ceiling of the, um, or to the top of the roofs. As I mentioned, um, there was this post-election violence that broke out in Kenya in 2008. And for political reasons that I'm not going to get into here, the police barricaded off a lot of the entrances into the Kibera slums. And people were cut off from access to food for a long time. And um, there was this French NGO called Solidarité that decided that after that, they wanted to come in and provide aid, food aid, but they wanted to teach people to farm. And they noticed there had been a small number of people that were doing this sort of container gardening, sack gardening. And so they provided the resources to scale it up. So at the time that I did my study, they had gone from you know, maybe a couple dozen households doing this to about five to 10,000 households um, throughout the slums were now practicing sack gardening. And they did this by training f field technicians to go teach workshops on how to build them, providing seedlings to help people plant and so forth. And so when I went to, to look at sack gardening, it was relatively new in Kibera. It had been scaled up and kind of established for about three to four years at that point in time, maybe three. Um, and so I, there was still a lot of discussion. They, people said, you know, three sack gardens in front of a house, like how much can that actually help people in terms of food security? Um, people said it's way too contaminated in the slums. You really ought not to be growing any food there. Um, basically, this this isn't worth doing. So there was a lot of concern from NGOs and government officials about that. And then there was, there was really no acknowledgment about this aspect that I talked about of um, how sack gardening might be sort of drawing the community together. Like how is this an environmental or a food justice issue? So I went in and um, we, we conducted this research project to kind of look at this. So was it actually having a meaningful impact on food security? Was there a risk with farming in Kibera? And then how was it sort of changing the way that people thought about the environment in Kibera? So um, this was sort of a beast of a project. We had a lot of different things that we did. Um, we started out just doing qualitative interviews with different farmers there um, to understand the process of sack gardening because it was relatively new. One of the interesting things is that uh, particularly in in many parts of Africa, domestic gardening, so gardening for sort of subsistence purposes, is very much considered to be a woman's job. So it's consistent with this idea of maybe having kitchen gardens or in rural areas, women often are um, tasked with growing food for household consumption and men will often grow the cash crops. So probably 95% of the farmers that I talked to were women. And the men I talked to were so funny. They were very entrepreneurial. I said, what do you do with the kale from your sacks? Oh, I sell it or I make my mom cook it for me. Like they wanted nothing to do with sort of the home consumption of this. So we did these interviews with farmers just to kind of get a sense of like what data should be included in a household survey. We then went on and did the survey of both farmers, so people who had these sack gardens, and then non-farmers, meaning neighbors essentially that, that were not practicing sack gardening. We collected um, soil from the sacks. We bought kale from the sacks. Um, we wanted to comp compensate the farmers for purchasing some of the kale so that we could then analyze it to figure out whether it was contaminated. And we also collected um, samples of the irrigation water that they used. Um, and then finally, we did these focus group interviews with both farmers and non-farmers to get at this idea of how their perceptions of the environment had changed and this idea of community empowerment. So I love this picture because it really captures kind of how sack gardening was happening in Kibera. Um, so this is one of my research assistants, Dennis, I was interviewing a farmer. And so she had set up shop with all of her sacks right next to her house. And I don't know how clearly you can see with the lights here, but this right here is a drainage ditch. So as I mentioned, there's no formal sanitation system in Kibera. So the way that people keep their yards and environment clean is they sweep it. And they just sweep it into a drainage ditch. And then their neighbor sweeps it. And it to a drainage ditch, and it just sort of gets carried all the way through these little um, drainage networks down to the Nairobi Dam. And so this is basically raw sewage sitting right here. Um, and people are farming right next to raw sewage because they have no other options. And so there was a lot of concern on the part of the farmers about how clean their vegetables were, because there were just tons, I mean, so many flies that you could literally see the fly poop on, their, on the kale, like big brown spots all over, all over the kale. 
Um, the farmers that the farmers and non-farmers that we looked at were pretty relatively similar. You can see that family size is um, actually relatively small compared to sort of the stereotypes of a huge African family. So a lot of sort of the effects of urbanization and economic constraints have caught up in Kenya, and so family size is dropping pretty rapidly. Um, Kenyan education system is divided into primary school and secondary school, so upper primary basically means they got through maybe fifth or sixth grade. Um, so not a lot of education. And they were a relatively young group of farmers um, on sort of the high 20s, low 30s. Kale, as I said, is one of the more commonly grown crops there, but they also grew I should have swapped that out. Spinach is Swiss chard. So they, they grow lots and lots of Swiss chard there also because it has that habit where you can kind of pick part of it and the plant will continue to grow. And they also grow a lot of coriander and green onions. And this is primarily subsistence, but about a third of the farmers end up selling some part of their crop to kind of supplement their income from it. Um, and this looks like a tiny amount of money here, but this is actually a huge proportion of the amount of income that they survive on. So average household income is maybe 50 to $100 a month, so getting $5 from the sale of their crops is significant to them. Okay, so this question of food security that I was talking about. Um, there are lots of different ways that you can try and figure out whether a household is food secure. And when I mean food secure, I'm talking about do they have enough to eat? Are they getting enough variety to eat? Do they have access to the types of foods that they want to eat? And one of the ways that you can do this is by measuring how diverse someone's diet is. So if you think about sort of the stereotypical poor person's diet in the United States, people might subsist on rice and beans or macaroni and cheese. Um, but if you kind of count which different food groups they're eating out of, it's pretty limited compared to somebody that perhaps has unlimited access at the grocery store unlimited financial access, so they can buy whatever they want. They might start buying all sorts of fancy fruits and vegetables and all sorts of condiments. And so you can see that um, there might be some sort of relationship between dietary diversity and how well off a household is and thus how food secure they are. This is a lot easier to measure than measuring things like calories and counting people's portion sizes. And so it's kind of a rough and dirty way of looking at food security. And it's this index that was developed by the United States um, Agency for International Development, so USAID. And basically, you go in, you ask people about everything they ate in the last 24 hours, and then you ask for all the ingredients and the meals that they cooked. Fortunately, in Kenya, meals are pretty simple. And then you categorize them into these 15 different groups. And they're grouped because of their nutritional value. So for example, um, Orange roots and tubers are grouped because they're high in vitamin A, and orange yellow fruits are grouped because they're high in vitamin C. So the idea is, you know, you've got your different protein sources and so forth. And then because Kenyans diet, the sort of average Kenyans diet consists of ugali, which is this starchy maize porridge, which in Southern Africa is called sima, but it's like, uh, it's just cornmeal mush, basically, which in Kenya is cooked so hard that you can like cut it with a knife and then use it to scoop stuff up. And then they eat leafy green vegetables that are chopped up in different forms, and that's about it. <laughs> um, if they can afford it, they'll add some sort of fish or meat or something. So because leafy green vegetables, which is a single category there, is so important, we actually asked about all sorts of different vegetables that they grow. And when they grow things like sweet potatoes and pumpkins, unlike here, they are eating their leaves. So pumpkin leaves have this very like prickly texture too, which I could never quite get used to. So we found that in terms of vegetable diversity, farmers um, consumed a much greater variety of vegetables. And it was interesting because they were only growing a couple of different vegetables, but what they were doing was selling their kale, selling their Swiss chard, and buying indigenous vegetables at the market, which were considered to be more, more expensive and which have lots of sort of improved nutritional values. Um, and so we saw that their vegetable diversity was improving. We did also see that a very mild effect in terms of their overall dietary diversity improving. And it was sort of heartbreaking <laughs> doing this part of the study because when you would do these 24-hour recalls, the average family would have maybe tea with milk and sugar for breakfast, and then you'd ask about snack, nothing, lunch, nothing, afternoon snack, nothing, dinner, ugali, kale, 
maybe a little tomato mixed in. So I mean, these are really limited diets that we're talking about. To, so to see even a little bit of um, a change is significant from these sack gardens. We also asked about um, food security in terms of whether or not um, consuming food from their garden improved food security. And so they said, without a doubt, that it saves money for other kinds of foods, it provides extra food, all sorts of positive effects. People's perceptions of food security have been shown to be almost as important as whether or not they're actually getting the calories in the sense that um, it can cause really high anxiety not knowing where your food's coming from. So something important that came out during these qualitative interviews is that um, it was seen as this uh, sort of leveling factor. So in times of need, people knew that they had something to go through. It was like a security blanket. So when I was asking, like, what are the benefits of sack gardening, one of the farmers said, the first thing is that it helps a lot. I never go to sleep hungry. And even your child can never sleep hungry. So she knew she was only getting a few days worth of vegetables out of it. But if she really needed it, she could sell it to her neighbors or she could go pick something and cook, which is, um, which is important. And it's something that we are also seeing with community gardens in very low income neighborhoods in the United States. We asked people to rate. Um, how food secure they felt according to the scale, like always eating enough of what they want all the way to frequently not eating enough. And again, uh, the first thing I'd like to point out is if we're comparing farmers and non-farmers here, this is 10%. So fewer than 10% of households felt food secure. But where you start to see a difference here is that farmers were eating enough but not what they wanted, whereas non-farmers were sometimes not eating enough to frequently not eating enough. So it was just shifting the balance ever so slightly, which is really a lot to expect of a few you know, sacks of kale outside of somebody's front steps. And then finally, the last way that we looked at this idea of food security was um, we said, OK, that was over one month. We're going to go back 12 months, and we're going to ask you how food secure you felt in terms of all of these scenarios, ranging from being worried about running out of food all the way to going an entire day and night without food. And you can see that there are really, really, really high levels of food insecurity in Kibera. So, almost constant worry about running out of food, or eating foods that they don't like. Oh, it was horrifying going through the transcripts for a lot of these um, interviews and focus groups, hearing people talk about buying questionable meat from the butcher, as in like they, didn't, they weren't certain that it was the animal they were getting. Like They were pretty sure it was cat and not beef or um, rat or all sorts of animal parts that they just couldn't identify, but they were poor enough that they had to eat it. Um, uh, and there were still a rather significant number that sort of reported going to sleep hungry at night. But where we saw a difference here was that farmers were statistically less likely to reduce the number of meals that they ate per day. So that it was sort of, um, and what we think is that this was related to this idea of social capital. So social capital, did I get to this here? Is this idea that um, social capital basically is defined as like the how strong are your networks of friends um, and your, your linkages to community members? So in a time of need, do you have someone you could call if you need extra help? Is there someone that could loan you money? Is there somebody that could give you a bit of food? Um, if you have a lot of social capital, you're well connected. If you have no social capital, you're basically on your own. And what we, and we had picked up in the qualitative interviews that these gardeners had shared vegetables with their friends on a really regular basis. So one farmer said, a benefit of sack gardening is that when I plant and the sukuma, which are the kale, are plenty, I harvest and eat them. And if you find that your friend does not have anything to eat, you pick some for them. So this was her saying, this is a benefit for me. Like I now have something I can give to my neighbor in a time of need. And we also looked at whether sack gardening had changed their relationship with their neighbors in Kibera. Kibera is one of these, how many of you have ever lived in like a dorm room or a crowded apartment or been on top of each other's toes? Little things can spark a lot of conflict, right? Like somebody doesn't do the dishes and you're pissed for a week. Um, Kibera is like that. It's this really inflammatory environment because it's so crowded and everybody is on top of each other and everybody is very stressed because they're in a stressful environment. Um, and so if we could 
measure whether or not sack gardening had sort of smoothed out those relationships and improved relationships with their neighbors, that would be really significant impact in terms of linking the community together and empowering them in some way. So what we did find was that overall, whether they were farming or not, respondents who had better relationships with their neighbors were just less likely to be food insecure. So they were less likely to worry about running out of food. They were less likely to reduce the number of meals that they ate. But what we also found was that sack gardening really played a positive role in improving relationships with their neighbors. So um, a lot of farmers, like two thirds of our farmers, said that they got along better with their neighbors than before they started farming. And this probably had to do with the fact that they were now able to kind of share food with their neighbors. Other farmers were really pissed because their neighbors kept stealing their food. But for the most part, it seemed to sort of have a good impact on um, their relationships. And so they were now much less likely to find themselves with no food in the house. And what was interesting is it kind of spilled over into other aspects of their lives. They talked about now having um, made friends so they had someone to watch their children if they needed to go do an odd job, or they had somebody to borrow money from if they needed. Okay, so that, that first question that I was talking about was people said this is a short-term coping strategy, it's not really worth paying attention to, people really can't farm in slum environments, and if they do, no way is it gonna impact their actual food security because it's too small of a quantity. And our research seems to suggest actually it does have a bit of an impact, it's not a vast impact. People who do this are not suddenly not having food problems, but it's, it's enough to kind of nudge them in the direction of being a bit more food secure. The second question, if you remember, was um, this concern over farming and polluted environments. So are there these trade-offs between improving food security but maybe being exposed to all sorts of environmental toxins through farming? So as I said, there are no formal sanitation systems in Kibera. It is a polluted environment. I am blessed perhaps with a really terrible sense of smell because a lot of other people that I work with in Kibera were like gag constantly from um, just sort of the open sewage that's there. But I was, I could smell it, but I wasn't terribly bothered by it. Um, but the people, even the people who live in Kibera, you just don't adapt to that. And so they had a lot of concerns over um, sort of the quality of the environment there. Concerns about not just uh, trash that was lying around, but because there aren't very many latrines in Kibera relative to the population size, and because people have to pay to use those latrines that are there, people often don't pay. They just go wherever, and there's this thing in the Kibera slums called a flying toilet, so people defecate into a plastic bag and then just chuck it wherever, um, and wherever it lands, that's where it lands, and oftentimes that's on people's houses, or on their gardens, or on their children, or, um, you know, there's, yeah. <laughs> need a thorough wash down after being in the Kibera slums. So when we interviewed farmers, they were concerned about the environment, and they were really concerned about these flies and dust, and again, I, I apologize that you probably can't see this very well, but all those brown spots there, that's fly poop. Um, so just really large numbers of insects crawling all over their plants, and so they were concerned about needing to really thoroughly wash and scrub. Um, there was lots of concern about people urinating and defecating on or near the vegetables, so lots of complaints about um, usually men coming home from the bar drunk at night and like peeing on their plants. Um, there was also concern that like if people didn't use these flying toilets, they would often go looking for somewhere that was a little bit more secluded and like sack gardens kind of create a barrier. So at night people would go behind them to defecate and then people would come out in the morning and find piles of human excrement next to their plants. And then lots of concern about trash near the vegetables. I, being trained as a soil scientist, was perhaps more alarmed um, when I learned that, I mean, there, there isn't a lot of open space. So to find soil, people had to be creative. They would go to any open space that they could find. And an obvious open space in a giant slum is the trash dump, right? So they would go to these big trash dumps and they would dig up as much soil as they could and they'd pull out the really obvious big stuff like plastic bags and pieces of clothing and broken glass bottles and then they'd put them into the sacks and they'd grow their food. And they had really awesome things to say. They said this is really rich soil because people had dumped organic matter there too, right? Like you, you know, all of their food waste went in with all of this other stuff. But I mean, there was everything in there. There was, you know, old cell phones, all sorts of old electronics. And so there's lots of concerns about things leaching into the soil um, that perhaps was not being accounted for. And then, <coughs> excuse me, 
people would explicitly go to these dump sites and dig them up as a source of manure for their plants. So we go to the garden store and buy fertilizer, they go to their dump site and dig it up. But they didn't, per they didn't perceive that as a risk. So oftentimes you see this with environmental problems. And this isn't just in Kenya. In the United States, it's really well documented that how people perceive risks and um, the way that we measure risks are often different. So I'm sure you can think of any number of environmental issues, but climate change is a really easy one to think about in the United States. Science models often say something different than mem members of the population say, uh, view uh, sort of the risk of climate change. And so this is true about any environmental problem and certainly was true about sort of the risks from urban agriculture. And the way people think about risk is often linked to education. Like are they, do they know about potential risks? It's linked to gender, it's linked to um, sort of their life experiences. So we measured perception of risk by, in our household survey, asking about kind of what concerns did they have, what did they do to mitigate the risk, and then we actually tested the water, soil, and kale for heavy metal contamination, so things that might have been leached out of those electronics or from old industries, or they used leaded gasoline in Kenya till the 90s and lead kind of sticks around in the soil, um, so lead. And then um, we kind of compared, and we also measured total coliform bacteria. Um, and total coliform bacteria is just a good indicator of all sorts of other biological pathogens, things like typhoid and cholera and dysentery and things that would give you diarrhea um, or, or much worse. So it was interesting, when we asked people what might be contaminating vegetables in their sack garden, they were very obviously concerned about dust and flies. And so we asked the farmers, we also asked the non-farmers, because that changes whether or not they're willing to sort of share food with their neighbor and um, maybe take on the practice themselves. Soil, really not concerned. Dust, flies, trash, big concern. In terms of what people did to mitigate these problems, so to solve these problems, they said sometimes they use different soil. Things that they were concerned about in the soil, they were most concerned about glass because they cut their hands when they were collecting the soil and putting it in the trash. But is anyone here taking chemistry? Is glass an issue in terms of consumption from that soil? Pretty inert, right? So, so that's like misplaced. That's, that's a good example of sort of perception versus risk. In terms of trash, they swept, they washed their vegetables, they put up these fences they constructed out of old, um, old sacks. For flies, dust, and human waste, they just washed their vegetables really well, they said. Sometimes they put a little bleach into the wash water. And basically they said, we do this and now our vegetables are fine. Like, no concerns about the quality of our vegetables at that point. Heavy metals was something that literally did not come up in conversing with 306 farmers, uh, or 306 people in Kibera. So all the farmers, all the non-farmers, qualitative interviews, no concerns about heavy metals, largely because most of them had not probably not gotten to chemistry um, in their education system. So they just didn't have any knowledge about that. But as I said, there are all sorts of concerns about it being in the environment from industrial waste, from batteries, from leaded gasoline that was used relatively recently in Kenya. And consuming heavy metals is nasty in the really long term. So this isn't something that's gonna be um, acute in the sense that it's a huge dose and they instantly get poisoned. But over a, a long term period of consumption, so 10 years or 20 years, there are really serious um, health risks. So there's concerns about cancer, um, lead in particular, there's all sorts of documented um, neurological issues, particularly in younger children. There are all sorts of concerns in the United States about lead paint, um, and so lead is an issue. It can cause chronic pain, so basically it causes severe osteoporosis in your bones, and your bones start to disintegrate, and you have severe pain. And um, Crops like kale are phytoaccumulants, which means they are really efficient at pulling all of these heavy metals out of the soil into their roots and then up into their leaves, which is the part that we consume. And so more so than, say, a tomato plant or a pepper plant, consumption of kale puts you at risk um, if the soil is heavily polluted and if you consume it frequently. And in Kenya, they do. They eat it very, like on a daily basis. So um, as I said at the beginning of the talk, we went and we collected these soil samples. We collected um, plant samples. This is us getting a sample of irrigation water. So farmers would go purchase the water um, for their plants because 
Uh, they didn't have you know, running water in their houses. And we analyzed them in country because soil permits are a pain in the rear to deal with. Um, and so we looked at a range of heavy metals, but in terms of analyses, I'll just talk about arsenic, lead, and cadmium. Um, so these are the different villages in Kibera based upon where people collected their soil from, so kind of stratified geographically. And this is the concentration of cadmium in the kale leaves if the soil was collected from these villages. Does that make sense? This line here is the maximum safe level that's recommended by the Food and Agriculture Organization and the World Health Organization. So you can see that there are perhaps some concerns about the concentrations of cadmium, but it's not outrageously above this recommended level. Although this is a very generic recommendation. So this is the FAO saying, on average, people in the world consume kale once a month, twice a month. So this seems like a reasonably safe level. Um, I think you'd probably be hard pressed to find an American that consumes kale with the sort of vigor that a Kenyan does. Not too many people eat it like every day. Where it starts to get a little more alarming is when we look at the data on arsenic and lead. So there are specific points, specific villages in Kibera, where if you collected soil from there, it was just really very polluted. So in this case, we're looking at ar arsenic levels, and you can see a similar picture with lead levels. Um, Makina and Mashimoni, which are two of the villages that, that are um, sort of alarming in both of these cases, are uh, a bit more developed in the sense there's a road that goes through them, the rail line goes through them, um, so there's just a bit more sort of traffic and industry that um, might have occurred there. And so we went and uh, collected GPS coordinates for some of the popular soil collection sites and then uh, referenced where they are from, and you can see there are these hot spots. So this is parts per million of arsenic um, and, and then where, they collected, where the soil was collected from. And so this line right here that's running through is the railway line that actually goes all the way from the coast of Kenya to Uganda, and it goes through the Kibera slums. Out here is the major road that sort of enters Kibera, and this was a football, um, sorry, soccer field, where they had dumped a bunch of soil, and the city council had dumped a bunch of soil and was smoothing it out, and they were gonna have political rallies there, and the farmers went there at night, like clandestinely with their little flashlights and stole all the soil before they could smooth out the field to build their soccer gardens. Um, clearly, wherever they got it was highly polluted. And you see this similar pictures with lead. There's a big road that roads here. And so are these, there are these hot spots um, in terms of sort of risky areas in the slums where people were collecting soil. But it's problematic because there aren't a lot of open spaces where people can collect soil. So as I said, there were these, these hot spots near the railroad, this open field that was north of Kibera um, along the road, and then there's this, the Nairobi Dam down in the southeast corner of Kibera. And so there was this geographic relationship where we could sort of tell community workers, we could tell NGO workers, we could tell the farmers, like these are places that really ought to be avoided in terms of um, concerns about soil quality. But the positive news, so that was sort of the scary news in terms of concerns about environmental contamination, but the positive news related to concerns about um, total coliform bacteria, which was that indicator of other diseases like cholera and typhoid and so forth. So we tested the kale and we tested the irrigation water. And then we compared it to kale that had been bought um, on urban farms near Kibera. We went to wet markets, which you can just think of as like big open air markets where there are you know, vegetable vendors set up on the ground selling their goods. Um, we went to supermarkets and we went to the high end specialty stores. So these are like the supermarkets that all the expatriates shop in because they're crazy expensive and they're in like secluded shopping malls and so forth. And if you look here, so these are orders of magnitude, right? And the cool thing is, sack gardening was sort of the least polluted of the kale um, that was found. So by like a couple orders of magnitude. So this probably has to do with the supply chain. When you go to a wet market or you go to a supermarket, the kale was picked on the farm and then it was probably washed in some questionably clean water and then handled by another person and stocked and then handled by another person and put into your bag. Whereas from the sack gardens, it was just like the farmer that was collecting it. Um, so the United States Department of Agriculture would probably have a heyday with those numbers, but by Kenyan standards, it was relatively clean. And when you cook it, 
it kind of kills all that stuff off anyway. So um, we were able to, to tell the farmers that a lot of their perceived concerns about the environment really were um, perhaps less threatening than sort of the other sources where they could get their food. But here's the part where I think the story gets the most interesting because it's, it's just not how people talk about urban agriculture in East Africa. So I'm gonna get up here just so I can show you this. So this is a Google Earth map of the Kibera slums, and I apologize, it's just very hard to see this, but this is the outline of Kibera. And what you can maybe see, if we zoom in, is there are almost no trees here. So these are all the tin roofs that I was showing you, or the metal corrugated roofs, and there's like a dot of trees here, a dot of trees there. But there's almost none of that green space that I was talking about um, having limited access to. And with green space, Green spaces have shown to be positive for the environment in terms of you know, improving air quality perhaps or um, maybe providing habitat for animals in, the United, you know, in areas where we think about green spaces being much larger. But the psychological benefits of green space have been documented to be even more beneficial. So putting a little green space into a neighborhood um, that has no other access to green space has been shown to lower crime, lower rates of depression, improve sort of community linkages, all sorts of things that you might not think would be associated with just having a few trees. And look what sack gardening was starting to do to this environment that otherwise was completely devoid of any green. So in these focus group discussions that we had with both farmers and non-farmers, we asked, we, we asked about environmental problems in Kibera because we wanted to know whether they thought sack gardening was changing the environment of Kibera in any way. And they were so quick to be able to list off you know, all the problems in Kibera. Um, so all sorts of concerns about air quality, animals crowding, electrical wires. There's no official electricity in Kibera, so wires are just sort of haphazardly strung as people kind of like pay the handyman to string it together. So there's lots and lots of electrical fires, lots and lots of examples of lines falling on the ground and kids touching them and being electrocuted. So concerns about um, poorly constructed houses, water, you name it. Oh, that was odd. So um, just as an example, one farmer said, in my area we experience all these problems, but the most disturbing one is the water situation. Most of the water pipes pass through those dirty trenches or sewers, which is the same water we use domestically. And their pipes are PVC plastic and crack all the time, so stuff just like gets in the water. Or sometimes you may find one of the houses does not have toilets. You find some of them opt to use plastic bags and later dispose of them, but they just throw them anywhere. It might even fall on someone. And this person who was talking said she'd had one land on her, so she was, she was quite upset. <laughs> but interestingly, people there fluidly merged. Like when we tried to ask about problems with the physical environment, they just kept talking about the social environment. For them, in urban areas, the social and physical environment were one and the same. Like you couldn't, you couldn't improve one without proving the other or degrade one without degrading the other. So they talked about all sorts of problems with noise pollution, with idleness, with really, really high crime in Kibera, um, with drug abuse. Um, and so they identified all these problems. And then when we asked about who is responsible for addressing these problems or could these problems be addressed, the vast majority of the people that we were interviewing in these focus groups basically just said they felt really powerless to address them. So in particular, they sort of linked it to corruption of government officials. So they said with the leaders we have these days, it's become such that whatever project comes our way, the chairman or the chief must be present, and then they hand out the jobs created to their relatives or people they know personally. All I'm stating is that our leaders contribute to this problem a lot. You have to bribe your way into a job these days. So in Kenya, if you look at sort of corruption indices for the world, Kenya is like one of, the more, one of the more corrupt nations in the country. And so it's easy to see how people as a community feel really disempowered. They feel very powerless to do anything. But when we started to ask about whether people could change the environment, the non-farmers kind of went back to this whole idea of like, why even try? There's so much corruption. Sack farmers talked differently. They didn't say they could fix the environmental problems in Kibera, 
But they did use really different sort of um, verbiage. They said, like, if we clean things up, the environment will be clean, or cleanliness starts with yourself. And they talked about all these efforts they'd gone to to clean the environment near their sack gardening and how that was changing how they thought about the rest of the environment in Kibera. So thinking about sweeping away trash or putting up these makeshift fences or having conversations with their neighbors about cleaning up the area there um, so that it would be cleaner for their gardens. And so to them, this was greening the environment there. Um, they said, you know, you see the way it looks here in Kibera, maybe the, there's no fresh air, there are no trees, but maybe the gardening project that started has made it better because now when someone comes to visit my house, they claim the air has changed here a bit. Normally the air we breathe is totally polluted. Or when you look back, you realize there's no more garbage in this area because of cultivation. So because they have these sack gardenings. So there's, they were, it was interesting because consistently they started to talk about how the environment was just a little bit greener or just a little bit cleaner because these sack, sack gardenings were there. Um, but it also had become this form of community empowerment. They really, spoke very passionately about how having set up these sack garden projects um, had impacted the social environment of Kibera. So they felt like now, because they were cultivating these areas that had been vacant, people were no longer going there as like a, an area to conduct you know, uh, drug trades or all sorts of other crime that was going on in Kibera. Um, and so uh, they felt there were certain areas that had been very risky, particularly for women and girls to walk through that now were a bit safer. Um, and they also talked a lot about how urban agriculture had become this teaching tool. So they were building these ecological, ecological citizens amongst their children. So they said, sack gardening has become a practical lesson for my children. It's helped them know the different types of crops grown in farms. At least now, if I take them up country to our home, I will not be embarrassed that they do not know things. So a lot of people maintain ties to their rural areas, like where their grandparents lived, and they talked about being thoroughly embarrassed because their children couldn't identify a tomato plant or a corn plant because they, they literally had no opportunity to see it. And now they had this. So it was a teaching tool. And this, I think, most aptly summarizes this shift that's kind of occurred. So at the end of the day, the whole community is now thinking as one and helping each other. Another benefit that sack gardening has brought to our community. So I don't want to glorify sack gardening. It hasn't fixed Kibera in any sense. But farmers really genuinely felt empowered by practicing sack gardening. Um, so yes. Sack gardening had these positive impacts in terms of food security. Um, modest improvements in dietary diversity, people felt a little bit more food secure. We found that perceived risks and measured risks in terms of the environment were not the same. Some were less, some were more. In terms of trade-offs, we're talking about long-term potential risk from heavy metals versus immediately improving food security. Probably one should continue to advocate on behalf of farming. And so you just need to consider how to promote it so the vegetables are safe to eat. But here's, here's where I went back and did these um, feedback workshops with policymakers, so people from the Ministry of Agriculture and different NGOs in the area and then the farmers. And what I really tried to emphasize beyond sort of these more practical findings were that the value of urban agriculture goes way beyond just sort of improving household food security or building social capital. And so we have the potential in Africa to talk about urban agriculture the way that we talk about it in, in more developed nations. It doesn't have to be this fantastic thing for the community here and coping strategy for the poor there. It can be seen as this tool to sort of build up community empowerment while we're trying to think about these issues of food insecurity. And it can be thought about as a way to, to address issues of environmental justice that they very clearly are facing as sort of poor, disadvantaged populations that don't have access to political will, to political capital, to social capital, to change their environment. And so it's really important to think about how do we facilitate urban agriculture. Um, so I actually was involved in helping draft an urban agriculture policy in Kenya that will legalize urban agriculture and therefore mandate the Ministry of Agriculture to send extension workers into the slums and help, help them work on urban agriculture issues. And so um, just getting back to this idea that we're now thinking about food justice, not just um, 
not just in the United States, not just in Canada or not just in Europe, but thinking about how do you bring together these issues of race, class, and identity in other parts of the world when we talk about food systems. So I feel like this conversation needs to go from being discussed in the global north to being discussed in the global south. And it has, to a certain extent, been applied to um, advocating on behalf of sort of disenfranchised populations in rural areas. So rural agriculture has gotten a lot of focus. How do we feed the poor? How do we sort of the Green Revolution conversations about this have all gotten tied up in this? But urban areas have been almost forgotten when we talk about agriculture in other parts of the world. And so how do we link together these ideas of food access, growing food, community empowerment, and environmental justice um, in developing countries is really where I have been headed with my research. So I'm now working on a project in Malawi, sort of extending this conversation to farming. Malawi is this like, sleepy country that nobody ever thinks about in sort of um, southern eastern Africa, where a lot of the same issues are being faced, but there's even less donor attention um, there. And so we're kind of looking at these issues of community empowerment through urban agriculture there. And before I wrap up, I just want to acknowledge um, I got a lot of funding support to do my research from different agencies, which was very much appreciated. And then I absolutely have to acknowledge all the amazing farmers that I worked with um, that, that helped me bring this data to life. So with that, thank you for listening. Courtney, thank you so very much for, for enriching us with this with this uh, report of your study that has essentially integrated physical geography, human geography, and then some, a bit of environmental perception thrown in there. It's amazing, really, when we think about how to empower those that are disenfranchised, often I'm sure we don't think that providing them with an opportunity to engage in their own agriculture really enables them to shape part of their own destiny. This is, this is really captivating to me. Are there any questions that anybody has for Dr. Gallagher at the moment? No? I have a question. Have you, when you were conducting your field work mm -hmm. in the slums, it's not a very pleasant place. And, you know, not all of us are, are blessed with the, with the uh, nose that I have that enables me to breathe all kinds of air and distinguish between many types, as you mentioned, really. You know, was that one of the one of the benefits, perhaps, of being able to to wander around? Was it a safe environment for you? Because I think not. No, no, it really wasn't. Um, I was pretty careful. I'd done a lot of work in Kibera before. I always worked with field assistants who were from Kibera. I also had a team of four um, male research assistants that uh, were university students that kind of we traveled in a pack together for the survey. But we ended up having to drop one of those villages. So we, our survey was in all 10 of those villages in Kibera, and we ended up having to drop data um, from one of them because we got mugged in the process of doing our research. And so they stole all of our surveys and stole, well, they stole everything off of me. Um, so we ended up we regrouped, we were able to, to go. But after that, I sort of was a lot more cautious about which parts of Kibera I went into, because um, it was broad daylight. It was two in the afternoon. Um, like, that must have been frightening. E yes, yes, it was frightening. But there's such a strong pull for me there. I actually had started a dissertation project on the coast of Kenya. It was this beautiful environment. Like, literally, I could walk to the beach and go snorkeling in three minutes. Um, and the project sort of disintegrated. And then I found myself working in the slums. And at first, I was um, interested in the question and kind of bummed about the placement, right? But there's, it's such an interesting sort of inner intersection of all these different geography questions and then the opportunity to work with a really disen disenfranchised population that I just, it made me want to cry every day leaving Kibera, but I kept going back because I felt like I did have this opportunity to give. It, it really was an amazing opportunity. Do you have any recommendations for uh, students that may wish to engage in field studies in Africa in particular? Um, I sort of fell into working in Africa, to be honest. I. Uh, 
decided to study abroad, which is something that I encourage any and all of you to do if you're able to um, for any amount of time. And I had been a high school exchange student to France, and so I wanted to go somewhere French speaking that wasn't Europe. So I just randomly picked Senegal in West Africa and moved there for 11 months, much to the chagrin of my parents. Um, but I sort of fell in love with Africa. I mean, people who work in Africa, as I'm sure Dr. DeVivo can tell you, just like it gets in your blood and you keep going back. But it doesn't have to be Africa. I just add, I really cannot advocate strongly enough just getting connected to another environment through study abroad opportunities. If any of you are considering at any point in your life going on to graduate school, there are often um, professors who already have established um, uh, research programs there that bring students to do work with them. There are all sorts of other ways to kind of get into the field through programs like Peace Corps or um, other sort of volunteer abroad opportunities. and so. So I don't know. I, I'm happy to talk with specific students. There are lots of different routes to the field, but um, train yourself broadly. I end up using all sorts of bizarre skills that I don't. It, 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 I mean, it, it is really unique that you went from soil science mm -hmm. to essentially a blend of cultural and physical geography yeah, and you know, I, uh, studies. I did master's work in Malawi, and I was working on a bean breeding project, and I I was there talking to these women and men about bean breeding and soil equality, and I thought, I am just missing, I'm asking the wrong questions in this picture. <laughs> like, I need to be talking to people about their cultural landscapes if I want to understand their agricultural systems. And also, then, you're able to shape policy. Yeah. You're not able to shape policy if you don't have an understanding of the people. Did you have a question? Hi, uh, I was not here at the beginning, so you may have addressed uh, sure. this. But I can I can see that most of the farmers that you put uh, there are are women. Is that true? Women are the the ones who are. In terms of in urban agriculture, it's it tends to be true. Um, depending on the size of the farm, like in, in Kibera where I worked, it was probably ninety five percent women. Um, if you look at urban agriculture more generally in Africa, it's often seventy to eighty percent, and a lot of that just that, why is that? a lot of that has to do with perceptions of what you do with this food. So in traditional agricultural systems in most parts of Africa, women were tasked with subsistence agriculture, and men are um, in charge of cash crop agriculture, and that has to do with whether they have access to money to buy tractors or seeds or anything. And so um, so this is just sort of a carryover. Ab urban agriculture is often small. It's used directly for home food consumption. So it's considered to be sort of the women's domain. It also fits really well with other things like taking care of babies and cooking and all that. At, at this point, we've run out of time. Let me just state, please, that there are more sessions over the course of the next two days. We um, will have a speaker tomorrow evening at the Fountain Street Church and then Thursday evening here, and there are talks during the day. Thank you so much for attending, and please give a last round of applause for Dr. Gallagher. Thank you so much. <laughs>